So a scripture this morning, we heard for it in the song earlier. It's from Romans 8, 38 through 39. It says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Our separation is impossible. So, so again, so I ask you, what can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. There you go. Way to go. So when I think of this, I think of a parable, a story with a spiritual meaning that Jesus told in the Bible about this love, and that's the parable of the lost son. You may know it. It's in Luke 15 of your Bible. And in it, there's this father who has two sons. And one son comes up to him and says, Dad, I know when you die, I'll get an inheritance. He's like, you know what? I would like it now, please. So his father agrees, gives him his share of the inheritance right then. So that son goes off and he spends what he has. He spends it on wild living. And that's that. He's making friends. He's making all those wonderful friends that always come around when you got lots of money for you. And he's pardoned. But then what happens? There's a famine in the land. There's no food for anyone. All his money runs out. All his friends leave him. He ends up having to work for a pig farmer. He's working in the fields. And it comes to the point, he gets so hungry, he looks at that pig slop and says, that looks delicious. It's like some good, good eating there. And that's when he comes to his senses. He's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Even the lowest person in my father's household, the lowest servant, has much more than I do right now. What am I doing? Perhaps I can go back to my dad. Perhaps I can go beg for his forgiveness. I can tell him that I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just please make me a servant in your field because I'm not worth anything more, but please take me back. So he resolves to go. So there he goes, and he's off to his father again. Well, he's coming along way down the road. What? What is that? Father sees way in the distance. That's my son. That's my son. And not caring what anyone else thinks, he goes runs off to his son. He embraces his son. His son starts with his rehearsed speech. He says, "Dad, I'm no longer son. Come here. Give him a big hug. Come on, guys. Come on, guys." And all the servants are there. We gotta have a party. We gotta have a party. Put the best robe on for him. We're going to have a barbecue. We're going to celebrate for my son who was lost is found. This is my son, and I love him so very much. In the story, we see that love that didn't waver, even in the midst of many circumstances that most people would find, all right, I don't really want to deal with you anymore. So in the story, did the son's demand separate him from his father's love? No. Those demands, what about his arrogance? I'm better than you, I deserve this share right now. What about the rudeness, the disrespect? What about, I don't care, you could be dead for all I care because I just want your money, Dad. No. What about the squandering? I gave you all that money. Your share of the inheritance, you could have done anything, you could invest in property, but what did you do? You wasted it all. Did that separate him from his father's love? No. What about the 
about self-control? What about the lack of self-control the son showed? Did that separate him from his love God? What about the fact that his dad was only the last option when he was starving? He didn't say when there was first a famine in the land, he didn't go back to his dad then. All the other options, maybe he tried to stay at a friend's house and that didn't work out. His dad was his last resort. Some people might say, I don't want you anymore. You're, you're just the last guy on my list. I don't need to hear from you. But that did not separate him from his father's love. To separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus is impossible. Now let's examine the scripture a little further. We'll go with the, the full passage in Romans 8, starting with verse 31. If you want to turn, this is from one of the Bibles in the pews that you can turn to. I'll turn it with you. It's in Romans chapter 8, or if you have your own Bible, that works well too. Look to Romans. Romans 8, starting in verse 31. It says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither <coughs> death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Love of God. It's so amazing. Such an amazing concept. It's been written on throughout the Bible. It's written on through many books, many commentaries, many preachers have spoke on the love of God. It's such a powerful concept. Today, we're just going over one aspect of God's love that generally has to do with believers. This passage is originally written to believers in Rome by the Apostle Paul. Many of these believers used to be Jewish and is a conclusion to arguments and teaching that he has made in, it's most likely from chapters 5 through 8 of Romans because in all those chapters, Paul is generally speaking about the security believers can find in Christ Jesus. Paul begins this passage by having the audience think of an example of people loyalty to God. He talks about the story of Abraham and Isaac. If you remember that story, you have God asking Abraham to show his loyalty by sacrificing his only son, the promised son he finally got. So Abraham does so and brings him to the altar to sacrifice him. God has him stop. He has passed that test. But Abraham and Isaac is just an example of a human example to us. And Paul is saying how much more is the example of God's loyalty to us through Jesus. The next verses they talk about how God acquitted us. How there's no condemnation. How Jesus is alive and nothing can separate us from him. True? Well, that's, that's one view of it, which is a very true view. There's a second view of that same part. 
when it talks about Christ being the judge, who is able to judge, it says that Jesus is the only one who's able to judge justly. And because of his position at the right hand of the Father, we are safe. We as believers are safe. Next, the Apostle Paul gives a list of eternal, external factors that can affect us. Like when he talks about the famine, or the sword, or all of those things. Things that may be really tough, these external factors, but, but we can get through it. We have that deep, if we have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ. In this list, a lot of times, he asks a question, and instead of saying, nothing can separate us from the love of God, this cannot hurt you, this cannot hurt you, he says, can this hurt you, can this hurt you, who can save you, who can love you the most? He gives, the Apostle Paul in this, I like it because he gives a compelling argument with having the reader think about what he's saying, because when someone asks a rhetorical question, a lot of times you're answering in your head, and you're really thinking it instead of just being spoon-fed the information. Paul really, you know, wants you to get in your head to know how the impossible separation from God's love is. And then after this, towards our end, our key verse, 38 and 39, Paul again writes another poetic list of terrible things. And these terrible things, sometimes we read it and we can get glean some things from face value, but we can better understand it if we look even further at who it was written to. So let's look at that list. In 38, it starts about neither death nor life. This is a little easier for understand, to understand, right? He's talking about death is not the end. Earlier, in one of his other writings, Paul says, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He's talking about how for him, oh, it's much better for him to die, because guess what? He gets to go see Jesus. He gets to go be with Jesus. But he goes on, so he can share the gospel, so we can win more people to Christ, so we can show that love of Christ to other people. Next, we look at the list of angels nor demons. Or if you look in your little note at the NIV, another translation, it says heavenly, heavenly rulers. This is interesting because, see, angels, why is that in the list of negative things? But even Today, not as much now as maybe 10 years ago, but if you all remember the show Touched by an Angel, there's many aspects even in our culture world where it was more okay, or angels in the outfield, more okay to see the angels and believe in them than believe in God himself. And back in the day, it had got to, in the Jewish culture, got to the point where everything had its own angel. Even you had the heads of grain growing in the field, each one of those had a little angel on it. So when you look at that, that can really be detracting from that. Also, you saw back then with all their, I guess you might call it mythology, their theology of angels had to do with how angels some of them were inherently kind of begrudging against humans because you have God and angels, and then in their theology, then humans created, and those angels were kind of upset with God. So you had this kind of verses like, why is this person doing so good? You know, I'm an angel, and they're just a, created by you for them. So you had that animosity. So that's why Paul says, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, which are those Angelic beings are really against the human. And then next we see, he says, the present nor the future. We see that, especially in that time, that's what the time was divided up into. Time was divided into two categories. It was either the present and the future. 
There really wasn't, there was the oral tradition of the past, but really what people lived in and they talked in is they talked in things in terms of the present, what's happening now, or the future. And Paul is saying, don't worry about that. Don't be so consumed with that. And then we look at powers, nor any powers. And that one we see another thing that could be read at face value because no powers can separate you and read what you will into the powers because even scholars are unsure of why he's saying all this parable. His death and life, angels, demons, present, future. And then he adds this little line of powers, just one thing, not powers nor something. So they're not sure why Paul chose to do this, but this one could be read at face value. Another one, height nor depth. Now that can be easily understood by us about height nor depth, nor anything being under, over, you could read as many things. But back in the day, a thing that's really interesting is that a lot of people looked at the stars and were looking at the height when the star was at its most position, furthest position, or depth at the lowest position, and the stars, depending on what position you are in, they influence you. And that was the thinking back then in the ancient world. So when he's talking about that, he's saying, don't worry, the stars aren't ruling you. Do not worry about them. And then he says, anything else in all creation or in some translations say about other worlds. Because Paul is talking about, well, if, because ancient worlds, sometimes they had all these beliefs about other worlds, and said, if it in fact exists, you still don't have to worry about it. Because nothing can separate from the love of God. Even if there happens to be some other world, that won't separate you from the love of God either. William Barclay summarizes the key verse this way. He says, you can think of every terrifying thing that this or any other world can produce. Not one of them is able to separate the Christian from the love of God, which is in Christ, who is the Lord of every terror and master of every world. Of what then shall we be afraid? Now, perhaps you sometimes wonder, is there anything that I can do for God to stop loving me? And the answer is always the same. Nothing. Nothing can stop God from loving you. If you're a believer, it's that simple. You're safe. But, but Peter, you don't, you don't know about this. You don't know about what's... You're safe. But, but you haven't heard. God will stop loving me if... But, but I did... But I didn't do this... Nothing. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because mm -hmm. if so, then you literally have nothing to fear. Remember, if anything like happens, those circumstances, but I did, but I didn't do all that. You just remember in 1 John 1, 9, when it says, if you confess your sins, he, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you don't believe, do you want to? Because Romans 10, 9 says that if you believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can be saved. So God's love conquers all. And will always be there for those who want his love and for those who don't want his love. God loved you so much that he sacrificed his only son for every single person and nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from that love. Nothing can take away from that love. 
There's another story in the Bible, because I love Jesus' stories and his parables. And this one is the parable of the lost sheep. This one is when Jesus is talking about a good shepherd, and he goes, and he has a hundred sheep, right? And one goes away. One is lost somewhere. So make sure it's like, 99, you are safe. I'm going to go find that one water instead of like, I still got 99. That's pretty good. That's a, still an A plus in school, 99%. But no, he's going to go, and he's going to find that one lost. Yet, he still loves those 99. Because nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. Whether you're that one person, whether you're the 99. So what can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray.